relationship between myeloma progression and diet. We often get the question from precursor myeloma patients, what can I do to decrease my risk of myeloma progression? And while there are some speculations about how fitness or proper diet could possibly slow progression, Dr. Irvi Shah has made it her mission to study the relationship between diet and myeloma to find real answers for precursor patients anxious to do more. Dr. Shah is a faculty on the Myeloma Service Division of the Hematologic Malignancies at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and her research focuses on studying the role of diet, microbiome, and other lifestyle-related risk factors in plasma cell disorders, as well as identifying interventions to improve outcomes for these patients. She also studies immune therapies, including CAR T cell therapies for myeloma. Being a lymphoma survivor herself, she is passionate about helping patients make wise nutritional and lifestyle choices as they face a plasma cell disorder diagnosis, as well as raising awareness about healthy choices to prevent cancer. Dr. Shah, I'm so excited to have you join us and excited to hear your presentation. So the time is now yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Audrey. And it's really a pleasure to be here again. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, and um, I'm really excited to speak to all of you about this topic, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. So we're going to talk about studying the relationship between plasma cell disorders and nutrition. These are my disclosures. Um, before we talk about plasma cell disorders, I wanted to bring to your attention two studies around COVID that were done. And I think this question comes up for all patients with cancer or plasma cell disorders or anything with an immune um, related issue, where what can I do differently to reduce my odds of getting COVID and the severity of COVID. So there were two really nice studies looking at diet and I thought that this is a right time to discuss it briefly. So this study looked at frontline health workers uh, from six countries, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, and the USA. And what they did is they looked at, they asked them to fill out dietary questionnaires and looked at what kind of um, diets they were eating. They divided them into plant-based diets and non-plant-based diets. And what you can see here is the significant differences in wherever you see the P less than 0 0.01 means that that is significantly different between the two groups. So vegetable, legumes, nuts, poultry, red meat, uh, sugar, sweetened beverages, that's different between these two groups and alcohol. Then they looked at those who, those who got COVID and what severity, whether it was moderate to severe or mild COVID. And what they showed is patients on plant-based diets or plant-based or pescatarian diets actually had, so anything less than one is a reduced risk of uh, developing severe COVID and anything more than one is an increased risk of developing severe COVID. So the low carb, high protein diets had higher risk of severe COVID, whereas the plant-based diets had a lower risk in all the different ways they analyzed it. And if one study wasn't enough, here is another study, and this is a much larger study. This is five, over 500,000 participants, and they had 31,000 cases of COVID in this. What they did is they, again, asked patients to fill out a questionnaire and then calculated an index called the Healthful Plant-Based Diet Index, meaning how many plant foods are they eating? And what they showed is that healthy plant-based diets was associated with a lower risk of uh, COVID. So you can see the... the uh, when it's one, it's the, it's the least risk. And then anything towards the right of one where you see the red arrow, it, it's an increasing risk. And those with um, unhealthier diets, meaning a low score, as you can see in red, had a higher risk of developing uh, COVID and severe COVID as well. Um, so that, that's one, one thing, it, not just for cancer, but even infections and things, especially COVID. Um, this is not a myeloma study, but I just wanted to bring it up because it brings home the point of like genetics is not everything. And many times patients will feel like, okay, I have bad genes. What can I do? I'm getting cancer or whatever because of the, my genes and I can't do anything about it. This is a colorectal cancer study, but as you can see, um, 
what they did is they calculated a healthy lifestyle score and they calculated a genetic risk score. So meaning looking at what genes are there and seeing which genes are higher risk to develop cancer uh, and which are lower risk. Then they categorized them into the high gene score, intermediate and low gene scores. And then in those same categories, they looked at their lifestyle and said that the black bars are unhealthy lifestyles and the white bars are healthy lifestyles. And as you can see, even in the low risk or the high, in each of these groups, it, it's not the same if the lifestyle was different. Um, so those with an unhealthy lifestyle had an excess risk over those with a healthy lifestyle in the high risk group. So there is a high risk genetic, a high genetic risk patient could benefit more from lifestyle modification than those in the low risk group, as you can see here. Of course, this is colorectal cancer, but I just wanted to bring it, uh, discuss this with you as um, I think it's important as we think about it. So I think good nutrition for cancer is important at all stages. Survivorship, of course, after you know somebody gets it for treatment. And I had shown an example in my talk last year, which you could um, refer to. And then in the prevention setting, which is what we're here to talk about in um, the smoldering myeloma and MGUS stages as well. So these are the talks that we had given, I had given last year um, with Myeloma Crowd and you could um, you know, go to the um, YouTube site and watch them. Uh, I tried not to repeat everything from then. So some of it, if you haven't watched it might be helpful. So at MSK, we have developed a research program to study nutrition, microbiome, and metabolism in myeloma. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I think the most commonly asked question by patients is what food or supplements can I take? And it's also often the least answered questions. We'll talk briefly about obesity, diabetes, nutrition, and the microbiome. Um, so I had mentioned this in my previous talk, but obesity increases the risk of MGUS. Once you have MGUS, obesity almost doubles the risk. So anything 1.9 to 2.6 is about two times uh, more likely to progress to myeloma compared to somebody who has a normal BMI. It, obesity is also increased risk to develop myeloma, increased death, death, risk for death once you have myeloma and also uh, myeloma with sustained BMI elevation compared to isolated elevated BMI. So if somebody has been obese for a long time versus if they're obese at any one time and then they go back to a normal weight. Also weight cycling, meaning gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight, that's also not considered good and increases the risk. So um, as you can see, obesity is known a known risk factor for myeloma. However, patients that unintentionally lose weight due to a myeloma diagnosis, probably do worse, but that's because maybe their disease is overwhelming their body and they're you know, losing weight from the disease. Uh, obesity mechanisms, you know, we published this last year where we looked at all the different mechanisms which, by which obesity might be leading to or increasing the risk for myeloma development. And I won't go into the details, but there are different molecules in the blood and the bone marrow that might be affecting it as well as hormones and insulin and insulin-like growth factor. Um, the next topic is diabetes and how does diabetes increase the risk of cancer? This is not as straightforward as obesity and there's a little bit more confusion around this in the sense that is diabetes increasing um, the risk because it's a correlation that diabetes and cancer are happening in the same people because of the same risk factors or is it that the diabetes is happening first and then the cancer is a result of the diabetes and I think that answer is not fully put to rest in myeloma but nonetheless it's important to know that patients who have diabetes have higher risk of developing it based on some studies. So these are two studies, one from Israel and one from uh, Canada, showing that diabetes increases risk of overall cancer and myeloma, blood cancers. We looked at this in a Swedish population and published it last year, where we showed that diabetes increases risk of MGUS and myeloma within six months of diagnosis, but not after, meaning six months of diagnosis of diabetes and not long-term after. And so there may be some detection bias like I talked about in scenario one, uh, but we have to, you know, th this is just a, a study looking at associations and it doesn't prove causation. Diabetes was not associated in this study with the risk of progression of MGUS to myeloma, 
But in another study, metformin used for more than four years was associated with a reduced risk of progression from M. gastromyeloma. So there may be something around that, but I think studies need to look at it further. Um, this is um, a study we did actually with the Myeloma Crowd and Health Tree Foundation. We surveyed patients through the Myeloma Crowd and 421 patients responded. And we asked them since their diagnosis, if they had questions around diet and nutrition, 82% said yes. 57% said their oncologist didn't really address it. 23% said they didn't address it despite asking. And then um, if a hematologist or oncologist gave them advice, the majority were 94% said they actually were able to follow them or at least tried to follow them. Um, the AICR or ACS guidelines, only a third of patients knew about them. And if they knew about them, about half of them tried to make changes to their diet. We then asked patients, are you interested in learning more about this? And you can see there's an overwhelming 90% interested in this. And um, we asked whether you would like the, your hematologist or oncologist to make recommendations, and many said they would. And they would be interested in changing their diet based on research available to date. So I think most patients are interested in this, and it's nice to see. This is the AICR guidelines, which if you haven't seen before, I encourage you to go to their website and take a look. This is general cancer prevention and survivorship guidelines, but it's, it's, it's very basic things showing you um, that food does matter, not just for myeloma, but even other cancer risks. Uh, we also asked the patients, did you make any changes since your diagnosis? And what we saw is actually patients make changes on their own. Maybe they read it online or they, they hear from uh, somebody, but patients made healthier dietary changes that were statistically significant. Um, and very few went from uh, very unhealthy to even like went from unhealthy to more unhealthy. Most patients actually moved in a positive direction post their diagnosis. So patients self-reported a significant increase in their consumption of plant-based foods and seafood and reduction in their consumption of junk foods and red meats. So what about dietary patterns and overall cancer risk? There are three big studies that were published in the world, basically one from France, one from the USA, and one from UK. And actually, interestingly, all three studies are showing the same thing. So the France study showed that higher plant-based dietary scores, meaning they calculated a score for every patient and said those who had higher scores had 15% lower risk of all cancers. The USA study from the Adventist Health Group showed that the they, they didn't make a score, but they looked at vegans, vegetarians, non-vegetarians, and they showed that the vegans had 60% less cancer than non-vegetarians. The UK study looked at vegans, vegetarians, seafood eaters, and meat eaters, and showed that the vegans had 19% um, less cancer than meat eaters, and so did the vegetarians. There are two studies in myeloma, and I, I've discussed this more in detail in the prior talks, but just briefly to show you that the nurses' health study showed that pre-diagnosis dietary patterns, healthier patterns, meaning these patterns, you know, are actually the Mediterranean dash and prudent are pretty much plant forward, meaning more plant-based diets. And then the Western diet or inflammatory diets are associated with a higher risk of myeloma death after diagnosis. And this is, so this is quite a significant uh, change, you know, in 15 to 24% lower myeloma deaths is quite um, significant. And the Epic Oxford study had actually the same study that I discussed here, looked at myeloma and they showed that the vegans and vegetarian had 77% less myeloma than meat eaters. Plant-based diets, you know, for cancer, I showed you epidemiologic studies looking at the association, but there are two studies um, looking at this more just from the obesity and diabetes perspective. And these are randomized studies, so I wanted to show it to you, where patients who were obese uh, were randomized half to um, the intervention group where they were given a plant-based diet, and then the other half is the control group where they continued on their own diet. And what you can see is that six months, there's a significant reduction. Again, a P less than 0 0.001 means it's significantly less uh, BMI reduction at six months compared to the control, which had no change. Same thing with the hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of diabetes, and also with the cholesterol, which is um, LDL cholesterol reduced. This is the same thing seen in both studies, so it's consistent. 
So we know that plant-based diets are feasible and effective weight loss strategies, but patients who um, are a normal BMI are not going to lose weight further if they're eating well on a plant-based diet. So this is good. You know, it works for patients who have a high BMI, but not if you have a high BMI, normal BMI, it's not that you're going to just keep losing weight. Um, 10 to 15% reduction in BMI at six months was seen in these studies. So how could a plant-based diet work? And I think there are multiple ways that it could, you know, the high fiber in the diet, the, the plant chemicals, they're called phytochemicals, the, the changes in weight, insulin growth factor levels are lower in those eating plant-based diets. The butyrate levels, we'll talk more of that, and inflammation, all of this may lead to cancer reduction. So what are plant-based diets? And I think there are many varieties. You could think about it as being vegan. Vegan is somebody who has zero animal products. Usually pe people who identify as vegan are doing this for ethical and environmental reasons. Um, diet, dietary factors are one of the largest drivers of global warming and also for um, ethical reasons where you know they, they don't want to be eating animals. But um, it doesn't always have to be healthy. They can eat a lot of junk food. Uh, French fries are vegan. Maybe cakes are vegan sometimes. So it depends. A vegetarian diet includes some animal products. And this is also often for ethical or religious reasons, um, maybe environmental. Uh, but there is eggs and dairy is allowed. And again, it doesn't have to be healthy, though it could be. A whole food plant-based diet is basically focusing on whole foods and less processed foods and more of a plant-based diet. This diet is minimal animal products and this is mainly for health reasons where there's a focus on, a, on whole foods and mainly plants and avoiding processed foods. So this is where you know a, a person can be vegan and unhealthy but or they can be vegan and healthy if they're following mainly a whole food plant-based diet. So I think, you know, it's important to be whole food plant-based, whatever you identify as, um, you know, focusing on the majority of your um, calories coming from plant-based foods. Um, some of the reasons, we'll talk about the microbiome a little bit. And um, this study shows you, um, we, I had discussed this study previously in uh, my talk also, but briefly I wanted to show it again. Where five, five, these were only nine individuals, five days each on a diet. They were given a heavy plant based diet and a heavy animal based diet, and they provided the meals for them. And what you see is patients on the plant based diet had obviously an increased fiber intake compared to when they were on the animal based diet, where there was no, very little fiber intake because fiber only comes from plant foods and you'll never get fiber in any animal food. And what they showed is changes in these stool metabolites. Metabolites are things that are made, uh, factors or molecules made by the bacteria in the stool and the microbiome. And what they showed is the butyrate levels were higher in those on the plant-based diet. And so are the acetate levels. And so there are different molecules that are activated or uh, synthesized by the bacteria based on the diet. And we do know that short chain fatty acids, these are short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate is, a, so is known to be an inhibitor of HDAC. HDAC is actually one of the, we have a drug in myeloma to treat called uh, panabinostat. It's an HDAC inhibitor. Uh, also, this pathway is known to be activated in myeloma. So we know that this inhibits these pathways and may be having anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory effects. Um, this is also very important. And I think, you know, understanding that eating, even if you're eating a plant-based diet, you want to have diversity in the plant-based diet you eat and not eating the same thing every day. There are some people who might just like, you know, their favorite vegetable or grain. We, we tend to do this in the world where everybody eats a lot of wheat and everyone might eat potatoes or broccoli, but then we forget that there are hundreds of other types of vegetables and fruits and pushing yourself to go out of your comfort zone and picking something outside of that is good. So those that ate more than 30 plants and compared to those that ate less than 10 plants per week. So think about it for yourself and count on average what do you do per week. And those who eat more plants, think about it as each plant is feeding different bacteria. So more plants you eat, you have a larger diversity or more types of bacteria in your stool and less antibiotic resistance. And um, also um, it, 
increase con conjugated linoleic acid abundance, which is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. So that's a good fat. So these are other studies looking at microbiome in myeloma. And what you see is that healthy individuals develop some microbial imbalances in MGUS and then further microbial imbalances in smoldering myeloma and in newly diagnosed myeloma. And this is based on you know, some small studies, but I think microbiome research is still in its early phases in myeloma. So these are the three studies. And the first one is just comparing and you can see that where it's red here, it's blue in, the, in MGUS and it's um, uh, blue in healthy. So there is a difference in the bacteria between the three groups. This study looked at um, myeloma and compared them to controls and showed that there was more diversity and more nitrogen recycling bacteria in myeloma. And these bacteria accelerate myeloma progression in mice. So I'll show you that in the next slide. And then the third thing is this is this study looked at um, showed uh, changes in the different bacteria again in myeloma compared to the controls and showed that there's a change in diversity, decreased diversity in myeloma. So um, this study looked at nitrogen recycling bacteria and showed that they actually might be accelerating progression of myeloma in mice. Obviously, this is a mouse study. We still have to understand what um, happens in humans, but I think that's why the trials we're doing are important. Um, in this study, what they did is they divided mice into three groups. They first gave them antibiotics. The antibiotics are given to kill all the bacteria that are present in the gut of the mouse, and then they gave them a transplant with um, a feces from a myeloma patient and then from a healthy control. And PBS is just saline, so this, this has no bacteria. And then they looked at uh, how quickly was the rise in the myeloma markers in the blood. And what they showed is from the, the, the mouse that had the microbiome from the myeloma patient had a faster rise in the markers than a mouse which had um, no had a healthy control uh, microbiome. So what it's showing you here is that the microbiome from a myeloma patient in a mouse might be accelerating progression in the mouse model. Then they looked at specific bacteria because they said like there is this bacteria that may be more predominant in the myeloma patient, and this is a good bacteria that was seen more in the control. And they showed that the patient, they did the same thing, gave antibiotics and then gave a specific um, bacteria to the mice and showed that those that had the bad bacteria, Klebsiella, had a faster progression in the myeloma compared to those who did not. The same thing they looked at with giving ammonium or urea. So this is where the bad bacteria may be using more ammonium and they sh or urea because these are uh, protein metabolism leads to uh, these, these um, urea and ammonia formation. And what they showed is there is an increase again in the protein of the myeloma faster compared to a mouse with normal saline. Um, these are three patient studies done at MSK, and what you can see here is in this study, um, patients um, w on my myeloma patients on maintenance therapy. So they had finished their in initial chemotherapy and they were on maintenance, and it showed that there were some of these healthier bacteria were higher in the patients who are MRD negative. MRD negative means that they're in complete remission and there's no evidence of their myeloma. So a good bacteria was more in those who were in complete remission. Same thing here. Um, this study looked at the good bacteria, the stool butrate producers, and they showed that patients who had more of them lived longer than those who had less of them. And then this study looked at, you know, this is not as relevant to myeloma, but this study is looking at if a patient had an allogeneic transplant, meaning cells from somebody else, um, not an autologous transplant, which is what we do mainly for myeloma. Um, it showed that patient, chronic graft versus host disease is a skin um, immune reaction when you have um, a transplant from another donor. And those who had higher butrate levels um, had less of graft versus host disease. So their immune system was able to um, have less inflammation and less uh, of these issues around a transplant. So the common theme in these three studies were the butrate producers. 
Um, this is a study that we recently did, and um, we presented the preliminary findings at IM, the IMW meeting last year. Um, this is actually the, the same first study that I showed you here, but we did some more in-depth analysis with patients on this study. So what we did is these are patients on my, with myeloma and lenalidomide maintenance, and uh, we collected dietary and stool data. So we looked at um, what they're eating at one we, uh, over the past year. So we just looked at dietary patterns. And what we did, we had was, um, we had about um, 30 patients who we were able to measure stool butrate levels and also look at the microbiome changes and then also had diet assessments. It was difficult to get everything on all patients just because you know doing trials in the prospective setting sometimes can be challenging to get patients to fill out things or drop off samples and you know some missed samples. Um, what we looked at, we correlated diet. So in the diets, we looked at flavonoids. Flavonoids are plant chemicals that are associated with anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory properties. And we also looked at the healthy eating index. This is an index where the higher the score you have, the, the better your diet is in terms of healthy foods. And then we looked at the microbiome. I told you a more diverse microbiome is better generally. And uh, we also looked at the abundance of butrate producers, meaning the good bacteria, how many are there. And then we looked at the levels of these metabolites or uh, factors that were produced by these bacteria. And then we looked at the outcomes, how many of the patients are staying in remission and is there an association with these diet and microbiome changes. And what you can see here is that um, patients who were, when you see yes, means they're in complete remission. And you can see higher levels of diversity, higher levels of um, butrate producers and higher levels of stool butrate concentrations in patients who were MRD negative. We then looked at dietary associations and healthier plant proteins and plant chemicals were associated with higher butrate levels. And this is not a surprise given that, you know, I showed you that prior study, not in myeloma, but there is an increased um, association. So dietary patterns with healthier plant proteins lead to, and more fiber lead to gut microbiome changes. And these may be the mechanisms by which they may lead to more um, myeloma control. Remember, this is a very small study. It's a preliminary study. So we can't really draw conclusions to say that this is uh, applies to everybody, but this is just showing us there are some patterns and there is something here to study further. Um, so thinking about tilting the scale for myeloma development, we know that, you know, over 3% of the population over the age of 50 have MGUS or smoldering myeloma. So this is a big population. We know that 70% of the U.S. population is overweight or obese. 45% is pre-diabetic or diabetic. So this is a big population of patients who have um, metabolic risk factors. And, and we know that all of these risk factors are associated with increased risk for myeloma. And then we know that these are associated with a decreased risk. So what if we tried to alter these factors and see if we were able to make a difference to um, the, the natural progression of myeloma in patients and understand the microbiome changes as well? So we, we basically our hypothesis is looking at diet and supplement and uh, with anti uh, these uh, plant foods and seeing whether changes in weight, inflammation, insulin resistance, microbiome, and immune changes may lead to a long-term change in myeloma proteins. Obviously, that is a hypothesis. It doesn't mean that that's true until we prove it or show. And it's very hard to prove because these are things that happen over years or decades. But I think if we are under able to show that there are some biomarkers that are changing, um, that we know are associated with worse outcomes or better outcomes, then it helps lend credence to what we're suspecting. So that's what we're basically looking at with this study. So patients on the study will be getting 12 weeks of a plant-based diet and 24 weeks of nutrition counseling. We actually provide the meals for the patients in partnership with a company called Plantable. And um, patients are followed for a year. Uh, this study has been enrolling for the last six months. And um, we, we have actually met, enrolled about half of, uh, half of the study and will continue to be recruiting for patients over the next six months. 
Um, these are the next two or three studies that are in uh, development, and I wanted to share a little bit about them. So this study is going to happen through telehealth and through the Health Tree Foundation. This is a much less involved study. It's going to be just two weeks. Patients can be anywhere in the United States. And if you're interested with smoldering myeloma, we'd um, love to have you on the study. The study is not yet open. I think it's going to take about six more months to open, but it would be good to know if, you know, patients, if you're interested in this study, you can let us know. Um, and in this study, we're also going to understand the effect of supplements because I think patients ask these questions and we want to see microbiome changes to understand what supplements are doing to the microbiome and is this moving it towards healthier or better outcomes. We have this study that's also going to open in the next four months. This study will be at MSK and probably one or two other partner sites. Um, but these are, again, patients with MGAS or smoldering myeloma. This is a more involved study where patients would have 12 weeks, similar to the first study I showed you, where patients will have 12 weeks of the diet, 12 weeks of supplement or placebo, and every patient will get the diet eventually at, at the next 12 weeks, eventually the first, second two arms will. And we'll be providing um, the diet, the supplements, and the placebo um, for the patients. So this study is also going to be enrolling soon. And if you're interested in a more involved um, study, but you might have to come in for a few visits, then this could be a study for you. Uh, we're also going to be looking at like now moving to the myeloma maintenance space. So I talked to you about three studies where we're looking at precursor myeloma, where it's smoldering myeloma or MGUS. But this is a study looking at patients that we actually have the maintenance study open where patients after the chemotherapy are going on either lenalidomide or daratumumab maintenance. They're, these are drugs for myeloma. And then we're going to offer 15 patients in each of these arms, 12 weeks of the diet and see what happens while they're on a drug. So this study will also be open in the next few months. Uh, but if, if uh, anybody's interested, they would have to first go on to the maintenance study. And then from the maintenance study, they would be able to consider uh, opting into the dietary aspect of it. So the dietary part is completely uh, patient driven. So if you're interested, if a patient's not interested, they'll go into the other arm. And this is not randomized. So if a patient wants the diet, they will get it on the study. So I just want to um, summarize a few points. Um, I think it's important to focus on healthful nutrition habits and quality over quantity. I know a lot of people focus on calorie restriction and things like that, but I think it's more important to think about each food that you're eating and whether it is uh, whole foods, unprocessed, and it's got a lot of um, plant foods in it. So uh, some summaries around it, carbohydrates, you know, it, Whole unrefined carbohydrates actually are associated with less cancer. Carbs are not bad. It's just that you need the whole grains. Refined carbs are not good. The unprocessed, the sugary drinks, all that you want to reduce. Fiber. Fiber is extremely important. And a lot of patients do not meet this, this 30 grams. And fiber only comes from plant foods, like I said before. Um, protein. There are studies looking at whether plant proteins better or animal protein, and they've shown less cancer and less mortality or death with plant protein. So favor plant sources of protein that could be beans, tofu, tempeh, and reduce processed and red meats. Same thing with fats, unsaturated fats, nuts, seeds, avocados, all of that is what you would prefer and you want to reduce um, dairy, fried foods, and things like that. Um, other things, just things to think about is, I think calorie counting and calorie restriction are difficult to sustain long-term. Um, when you try to switch your diet, think about it more as a lifestyle and do it gradually. Don't, don't think about it as a, a diet and this is a restriction. Don't focus on the things you can't have, but focus on the things you can when you're switching. And um, regular meal times is important, ensuring adequate hydration learning to read ingredient lists and nutrition labels can be helpful. And gradual changes are usually more sustainable when patients just suddenly switch and then they, they suffer because they're like, I don't know what to eat, then they're hungry and then they feel like this is not sustainable for them. Um, so the main thing is you don't wanna go hungry when you're eating. So um, you might have heard of something called the fiber gap. 
uh, and if you haven't, the recommended daily intake for fiber is 30 grams and uh, only 67% of consumers 67% um, of consumers believe they meet their fiber needs. So most, most of you must think that you get enough fiber, but in reality, only 5% of you do. So it, it, it's a really small number in the United States who are getting their fiber and fiber is your friend. So think about, this is another study where they looked at fiber rich diets and fiber free diets in a mouse model. And um, what they showed is that th this pink layer is the mucus layer in the intestine. This is the um, gut or the colon lining. This is the intestine. And these are all the bacteria in, in the um, intestine. And there, this mucosa is the healthy mucosa, that, a barrier that we need, this mucus layer barrier to protect our lining and prevent it. This lining tends to break down when there is no fiber because the bacteria end up eating this mucus because they have nothing else to eat. Bacteria eat fiber in general. So it's important to feed your bacteria with fiber. Uh, another concept I think is important is understanding calorie density instead of calorie counting. I think a lot of people focus on the calories and with that, it's very difficult to sustain it because you're always focused on, oh, this is too many calories and I can't eat it. But if you look at this and you understand what calorie density is, th these are all the same amount of calories, but fruits and vegetables will almost fill up your whole stomach. Um, with the same amount of 500 calories, whereas oil, just a few tablespoons are going to fill you up and it's 500 calories and not fill you up. So um, if, you, if you just eat more fiber and plant foods, you will be full more and you will not feel hungry and you will be able to eat. Um, another thing is reading ingredient lists. Not all bread is the same. So I just wanted to show an example here. Obviously there are many more examples, but this, this um, English muffin, Thomas English muffins market themselves as 100% whole wheat. But when you look at their ingredients, you will see that there is sugar, there's salt, there's a um, lot of other things in it along with uh, uh, milk. It's not just uh, a wheat bread. Whereas if you look at this bread, you see that there's nothing else other than just all the sprouted grains and um, yeast. And there's really, and, and the order in which ingredients are written is literally how much of the, the ingredients are. So the one that's first, the most of it is there, and then it goes down the list. So uh, you can see that the, the sodium levels are high in this one. The fiber is not as high as this one. So you might want to pick a bread that has a high fiber content, has no sugar content, like this one has zero sugars, this one has a gram. So this is just something to think about when you're buying your products. Um, same thing, this bread, um, probably not as healthy as this one, but still a very healthy option. If you look at the ingredient list, it's very clear that all of it is just um, um, whole, whole wheat. It doesn't have to be organic. This bread does say that, but it doesn't have to be. I'm, I'm telling you more to focus on the whole. If you see wheat flour, it doesn't mean it's whole, um, but this means it's whole wheat flour. Uh, another example, looking at yogurt and reading nutrition labels. So here you can see that um, these are all different yogurts and I've just like compared them just for you to understand what I mean. So non-fat doesn't mean it's better because it has more sodium, more carbohydrates, more sugar. And um, if you look at the 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 whole milk one will have more cholesterol. So cholesterol only, only comes from animal foods. You will never find cholesterol in plant foods. So you can see that two plant-based yogurts have zero cholesterol and the others have cholesterol. Sodium, so when they make non-fat yogurts and things like that, they have to make it, still make it tasty because otherwise when they take the fat out, they add sugar and salt. So it, it doesn't mean that non-fat is always healthy. Um, so it's important to look and think about these things. So a few things I just want to conclude with obesity, we know is a risk factor. Diabetes, we know is associated with myeloma, though we don't know whether it's causative or correlative. Um, we know that nutrition matters for COVID, for cancer, for myeloma. And we would um, also know that microbiome matters, but understanding how to manipulate and modulate it is something that's going to uh, we're going to see more of it in the next few years. 
So with this, I'd like to thank all the sources of funding, my team at MSK and outside the collaborators. And uh, if you are interested in participating in trials, if you have ideas for us of research that we could do, uh, we'd be glad to hear it or any support you're interested in. Um, so I think it's important um, to think about dietary habits. They affect comorbidities, they affect the microbiome, they affect your immunity, and may affect plasma cell disorder outcomes. So it's nice to keep your fridge full with a lot of options. So whenever you, you know, you're hungry, you're not picking the fast food or ordering last minute because you've planned ahead and you've thought of what you might want. And having a full fridge refrigerator is a good way to uh, mitigate that. So with that, I'll end. And, uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. And now we will turn the time over to William to share his story. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Will Wright. I'm um, 71 years old. I've um, been uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, a smoldering myeloma, MGUS, for five years now. Um, I had um, uh, been very concerned about my ability to stave off full-blown myeloma and uh, was um, uh, interested in doing all I can to be able to, uh, to, to mitigate um, any type of uh, behaviors that I was doing at the time to be able to extend my life. Now, what makes this to me so important is that uh, in 2010 was a very dark year for me. I was diagnosed uh, in the same week uh, having prostate cancer, as well as renal cell carcinoma, kidney cancer. And the reason, I, the, the way I found it, those, uh, those, those diseases, was that it was, um, it was uh, uh, July of that year. It was very extremely hot. It was record heat. I traveled in from Long Island to, um, to, to Manhattan, where I work. And this particular day, uh, I stepped off uh, the Long Island Railroad and going up uh, the stairs uh, at Hunters Point Avenue, it's three flights of stairs, a very steep uh, a station. And at the top of the stairs, I fainted. And uh, I normally um, uh, didn't feel uh, as though uh, there was anything particularly wrong at the time. Uh, but I went to work and I um, explained uh, to my boss that I was running late. And uh, um, just so happens that that week was Men's Health Week at my job. It was uh, NBC uh, Universal and it was Men's Health Week. And uh, my boss said to me, you know, you should uh, go see um, if they can help you because it just so happens that they have um, uh, urologists and, and uh, um, uh, men's health uh, experts on site at the time. And also uh, NBC Universal has a clinic. And so I should take advantage of those, uh, those the health benefit. Well, to my surprise, um, I uh, visited the urologist there and he, uh, uh, the first thing they did was uh, kind of check my, 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 uh, uh, my, my red blood cell levels and I was uh, hyper anemic. And uh, next week I stepped in and um, uh, into the hospital uh, for a battery of tests. And the first thing they found was that I had some nodes on my kidney, uh, which were cancerous. Um, but they didn't stop there. Uh, they also noticed that there were nodes on my prostate, which were cancerous. And um, I, it looked to me that I was doomed because uh, a few years before that, I was uh, uh, diagnosed as being diabetic. So it, it seems that when you have these type of uh, comorbidities, that it would be a death sentence that um, that that there is there is probably very little you can do. But fortunately for me, um, uh, the doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering didn't give up. They said, "Well, let's see what we could do about this." And so they uh, that year I had a um, uh, a partial nephrectomy, uh, which cut out all of the cancer of my kidneys, and I had my prostate removed, which cut out all the cancer in my prostate. But they explained to me that just by sheer coincidence, that incident that I had where I fainted was really important because it was that trigger that made me get myself checked out because both those diseases are fatal if they're allowed to continue 
unchecked, especially prostate cancer, especially among men. Um, so I then uh, 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 decided that I was gonna do all I can for whatever came up in my life to be able to do something about it. Um, in the, the, the Reno team at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, uh, noticed that there were markers in my blood test that showed that I was uh, uh, pointed toward a, uh, MGUS, a smoldering myeloma, and they uh, uh, referred me to uh, uh, Dr. Alexei Shingarev, uh, who since then left Memorial Sloan Kettering and said, but don't worry, I'm gonna put you in really good hands. And he pointed me toward Dr. Irvi Shaw. And I, um, I met Dr. Shaw and I uh, told her about all of my issues. And, uh, and I asked her, well, what can be done to prevent me from developing into a full-blown myeloma patient? And she said, the first thing you should do is try to lose weight. Because at the time I was weighing 216 pounds, um, 5'9", 216 pounds, that puts you in the obesity range. Uh, I think my body mass index was 36. It was pretty bad. And I was still uh, struggling with uh, diabetes. Uh, it was being uh, obese. It was unchecked. I had to use tons of insulin to stay, to keep that in check. And my dietary habits were absolutely awful. And they were awful because I like to be the one in my household to cook. I cook for my family. I've um, uh, always been that way. I, when I was in college, I cooked for my friends. Um, when I was um, uh, at home uh, with my parents, um, uh, I would follow my grandmother around the kitchen. She taught me how to cook. I am an amazing chef. And it's not necessarily the most healthy foods that you can have, but I can guarantee you it's the most tasty foods that you have. But, but the problem with that was I was obese, and anybody who hung around me was going to get obese too because my dietary habits were awful. So um, I tried on my own to, to lose weight. And I managed in the, in, in the eight months, um, uh, the first eight months in which I uh, met uh, Dr. Shaw, I managed to get that 216 pounds down to 196. And not necessarily by doing any specific type of diet, but just pushing away from the table, eating less, and, and exercising more and paying attention to portion control. And I thought I could never get any better. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Shaw would always coach me that my microbiome and the uh, uh, eating plant-based uh, foods might be more beneficial to me. And she explained to me, and just as she uh, uh, spent the last uh, um, uh, uh, 20, 25 minutes with us, going through the details on how it could be beneficial to you. And I am just so very fortunate that I was smart enough to pay attention to what she was telling me to listen to me. And then she said, we have a study that's coming up. And if you're interested in that study, we, I might be able to put you in and, but you'll, you'll have to uh, eat the food that we give you. It's going to be plant-based. And the first thing I thought was, well, you know, culturally, that's an issue because um, uh, being my, my family chef and African-American foods tend to be fatty and very meaty and extremely seasoned. I'm not sure if I can, if I'd be able to follow a vegan diet um, and, and if I can make it tasty, if I, and, but I promised her that if you allow me into this study and, and give me the opportunity to improve my chances of surviving MGUS and not developing to myeloma, I promise you, I will do everything I can to show you that A, I will pay attention to the diet. I will eat specifically what is given to me and I will take all of the tests because I want you to see if there is any changes in my body, not only for me, but for also for African-American men who were very rarely part of these type of studies because of institutional distrust and also issues that we experienced um, in the past in terms of not being very, not feeling as though the medical community was operating in our best interest, but for things they that was in their best interest. But I, um, my, my, relationship with Dr. Shaw was something that was 
was was was almost magical because I, I think that that the success that I have at this point um, uh, with Memorial Sloan Kettering was that um, uh, the medicine the medicine was important, but the trust that I had in the doctors were part of it. Then I really took an exercise regimen. My daughter in the mornings uh, uh, leads for the past year and a half has been leading my wife and me and a team of her friends and body pumps. So we've been doing exercise. So family, diet, um, exercise and medicine became the cornerstone of my plan to survive this MGUS thing. So uh, come August of this year, uh, when the study started, I started getting food delivered to my house once a week from Plantable. They, um, they provided for me um, uh, food for um, uh, five days a week. Um, and it was for um, uh, three months. And uh, the, 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 the two days that I didn't get Plantable foods, I was to, I was to follow a plant-based regimen to augment, to, to, to support what I was doing. And I think it was that way, so I wouldn't go cold turkey. But it's, as it turns out, um, uh, with the food that I got from Plantable, um, I started dropping pounds very quickly. And it wasn't because I was hungry. It wasn't because I was starving myself or because I was sick. It was because um, the uh, impact of how Plantable uh, viewed uh, their, their, their dietary regimen was scientific. So um, if you, if I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I, I, I play one from time to time when I was writing uh, articles. Uh, but one thing I did notice um, in, in looking at Dr. Shaw's uh, presentation is that there are very specific markers, very specific chemical reactions uh, that plant-based diets have for you. Um, uh, uh, the way they react in you, the way they react in your gut, the way they uh, 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 they uh, 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 supplement your body's immune system, and the food that was provided for me had the science behind it. So I recognized that if I really paid attention to this, that I would benefit greatly. And as it turns out, that uh, in August of 2021, I weighed 196 pounds. And today I weigh 163 pounds. My um, body mass index is uh, 24.1. So I'm officially no longer ob obese. And I was managed to, if you consider the fact that it was 50, 53 pounds weight differential uh, from the time I really started on this journey to now. And my energy level is through the roof um, um, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, my, my physical strength and uh, my, my moods, my happiness, uh, uh, and my outlook for survival for the future. Um, all of that is, uh, has, been, has been buoyed uh, by just paying attention to the diet. And did I ever think that veganism would be a thing for me? I could tell you, I've, I have a lot of friends who are, are Mediterranean uh, in, in, in their culture. And um, I would go out with them or I would go to their house and they would have their Mediterranean food and it would be vegetarian. And I would say, I'll be back. And I'd go out and have a hamburger because that was to me what was satisfying. And I never thought I would be able to get to this point. Um, but I found that um, with the creativity uh, of, uh, of what I know about how to prepare food, there's, there's an, I, I look forward to preparing meals that are plant-based and, uh, and, and relatively healthy. Um, I um, get recipes from, um, uh, from Plantable. I get recipes from Forks Over Knives. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, websites out there that are willing to help you and very generous with their, with their ideas and with their information. And I've been very, um, uh, I, I've been, I've, I, I just feel so fortunate, so very lucky uh, to have uh, encountered um, uh, this lifestyle. And, uh, and I mentioned lifestyle because it is, it is, it is a change in lifestyle for me. 
uh, even uh, even the times of day I eat, the, um, the the fact that I I now make sure that I um, uh, uh, log my food, and that's really important because uh, Dr. Shaw's uh, 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 study requires you to log food. And the fun part was that I uh, was logging food, and I uh, went to Dr. Shaw, and I said, you know. I don't mind logging the food, but there's not enough room on this paper for, for what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So I'll just take a second and, and show you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm no longer in the intervention part. Um, it's the maintenance part of the study, but I wanted to show you what I do to... Uh, uh, We'll also share about your diabetes experience. I think you didn't share about that. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, well, before we get to that, then let me... No, you can leave that. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me, that, that's really important because yeah. I mentioned that I was diabetic and I took a lot of insulin prior to um, uh, getting uh, into the plant-based diet regimen. So you've been diabetic what? for over 10 years, right? Uh, for, for, for 15 years, for 15, 15 years. years. I started off uh, with metformin. I found that uh, my diabetes was so out of control that pills, pills were not work working for me so i went to injectables i um i uh, i uh, uh, uh levomir uh, and novolog levomir to kind of get me through the day and novolog um for whenever i um spiked yeah. and i would literally chase my um uh my 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 highs and lows and it was it was more like a cat and mouse game um and then uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to keep my kidneys and my uh, internal organs in check, I first started off using Bietta. Um, uh, that stopped working. Uh, so then I was uh, moved to Victoza. And uh, now I'm on Trilicity. Um, but the point is, I have not used a shot of insulin since August. Not a single shot of insulin. And the interesting thing, I could even uh, show you some, some interesting things about that. Um, uh, let me, uh, let me do this. I will first show you my log. Okay. Well, I we're talking diabetes, right? <laughs> so let me, this is, um, uh, this is, I, I use clarity to kind of keep me uh, 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 whole in terms of uh, where I'm at. And at this very moment, uh, my blood glucose, glucose is 125. But you can see this is my range today, which is really interesting because this is 180 to 70. This is where I'm supposed to be and stay in, those, in that range. And you can see it's pretty steady. It's very All remarkable. I wanted to add one thing, Will. Mm -hmm. Plant-based diets you would think about as high carbohydrate diets because you know mm -hmm. uh, it's low low protein, low fat, and mm -hmm. despite being high in carbohydrates, your sugars are within the normal range. So mm -hmm. complex carbohydrates aren't really bad if you're diabetic if you're following like a whole food plant-based diet. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to bring that out too. Yeah, and and also you know um, uh, I. Uh, I used to love drinking Coca-Cola and I used to love drinking cognac. Uh, all of that is behind me. You know, uh, I, um, uh, if you can, I'll show you my, my, my food log. Uh, I, I, when I came off the intervention uh, part of the study, I started maintaining uh, my own log and you can just see um, uh, going from October, you know, where I would log what my breakfast would be. Uh, well, well, we can't see the food log, so you're going to have to you have switch your screen, uh, I think, or share, uh, pull out. I, we can still see your blood sugars if you want to. Oh, oh, oh got it, it, got it, got it. Okay, let me, uh, thanks for telling me. Let me see. Uh, let me, let me pull out for a second. Okay, let me go behind here and see what's going on. Okay, let me close the blood sugar, got that. Okay, now, let's see. Sorry about that. Okay, let's see here. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, good, <laughs> all right. So, so I put together, I. One of the things that that was really important when I was um, uh, I'm retired now, I've been retired for over a year and a half. 
But when I was working, uh, one of the things that we felt was really important in, turn, in, in my line of work were metrics. That in, in, in order for you to make a change, to see how you're, you're doing, what the output is of your productivity, is to log it. And I felt that the most important thing to keep me on track with my diet was to log my food. And if you log your food, you get a sense of where you're going and where you're at. For instance, um, uh, back in October 16th, and I'll just go from the top all the way to the bottom uh, very quickly. Um, on this day, uh, I weighed 168.6 pounds. My blood sugar was 103 on that day. That was my average. Uh, if we go all the way down to my very last day, Monday, uh, well, let's go to, I, I didn't finish here, but let's go to Sunday where I logged my food. I weighed 164.8 uh, pounds. Um, uh, and uh, I also logged uh, my, um, my blood pressures. And I also logged my glucose levels, which I showed you. And the thing is when you see all of this in one place, if you see how you're, how you're doing, it becomes, not scientific, but it's 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 almost it's it's an epiphany it's an epiphany in terms of how your body is 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 helping you, and you're able to see how your body is helping you and what your body is doing for you, and um, and so um, in summary, I I could go on. I'm I'm just so ecstatic about what has happened for me. Um, I can go on for a, for a while, but uh, I I just I. I, I'm willing to, if anybody uh, wants to do a follow-up up with me, uh, you can uh, uh, contact, um, uh, uh, well, you contact me. I'm, I'm willwilliam.wright at <laughs> ftc.edu. Uh, so, um, so contact me and I'll be very happy to share all of this information with you and all that I've done, because I will, I want to see everybody as successful at this. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to Dr. Shaw for just being my, 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 my guardian angel. I was, I, I, I just, I was, I was telling Audrey how, uh, how fortunate I was. Um, not that I, I, I really enjoyed working with Dr. Shingarev, but he left and turned me over to Dr. Shaw, and it was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I really do appreciate you, and thank you, Dr. Shaw, for, for your comments. There's lots of questions here. I'll try to ask the most popular ones, and um, thank you again, both of you, for sharing your experiences and data with us. Yeah, thank you, Will. That was uh, really nice of you to share your story. And it is really impressive how you've taken your own health into your hands. So very, very yeah. impressive story. Proud of you. Help. Proud of you, Will. So one of the questions that's frequently asked here is, what about coffee, tea, alcohol? What were your recommendations regarding these in terms of a whole food plant-based diet or healthier diet? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, green tea is good, coffee is uh, good, but the issues that come with it is like the sugar that goes with the coffee or the tea, the, um, sometimes the, the, if there's a lot of milk or things like that, that's what adds to the thing. But coffee in itself and green tea have actually been shown to have beneficial effects towards the microbiome and overall health. So I wouldn't say you have to cut out coffee or tea, you just want to figure how you're having it and um, try to minimize on um, the, the sugar especially and uh, consider milk that's, you know, either a plant-based milk, if you would like to do that, or if you're doing regular milk, then do a little bit, not too much. Awesome. Thank you for that. And then in terms of alcohol? Uh, so alcohol in general has been associated with an increased risk of multiple cancers. So it, alcohol consumption has an association which is quite strong. Uh, for myeloma, interestingly, there was one study that looked at this and showed that alcohol maybe has a decreased risk of myeloma, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because all the other studies are showing an increased risk, right, for other cancers. And I think part of it could be that red wine has resveratrol or um, these polyphenols, as we call them, and they could have anti-cancer effects. But I don't think you need red wine to get those. You can just have grapes and get them or 
plant-based food. So yes, if you want to have a little bit of red wine or, you know, alcohol, I wouldn't say like you have to cut it out, but, but it's good to do that in moderation and a little bit. It's very clearly linked to many cancers. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's another question about intermittent fasting. Uh, is that something that you recommend to your patients? So I'm not a proponent of trying to calorie restrict fast to do all of those things because it just makes it very difficult and you're, you are um, um, restricting yourself, which becomes hard for, a, you know, to do long term. If you find that intermittent fasting works well for you, there is some thought that there are beneficial effects on the metabolism and things where you have these brief periods where you're not eating. But I think part of why intermittent fasting may work is because overall you might just be eating less calories because you're eating for less time in the day. But if somebody is going to fast and then be so hungry that they eat a lot after, then I don't know that intermittent fasting is doing a lot. So I, there isn't a lot of data in myeloma. I know that there might be some studies from other centers looking at these things, but um, I, I would say uh, if, if it works for you, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but I, I don't think that, I think it's more important the quality of the food than, you know, trying to not eat at time. Definitely. Thank you for that. Another question is about probiotics. What are your opinions about taking these probiotics? And then there's follow-up questions to that, but let's sure. just... So probiotics, I think, is a complex issue. Um, I would strongly recommend that patients focus on um, diet tree changes, which are considered prebiotic because they, the fiber leads to changes in the gut bacteria. Probiotics, actually, in one study recently published in Science by Spencer, it's from MD Anderson, this paper, they looked at melanoma, and this was immune, they looked at patients who were on immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors, so we don't really use them in myeloma, so this is not applicable exactly, but they showed that those on probiotics actually did worse with the treatment than those who are not, so there may actually be something where in a probiotic, there are only very particular few strains of bacteria, and you're not getting a diversity like with food that you eat. And so you're actually reducing diversity possibly with probiotics. But there are other studies showing that probiotics might increase the butrate producing bacteria or the good bacteria because these probiotic uh, supplements try to enrich for the good bacteria that make these good molecules. So I think the jury is kind of not out on it. For myeloma, we don't know. That's why we're going to be studying it with a new prevention two study. It may not be right for with certain immune therapies and combination, like I said, but I think if you can do it with your diet, you don't really need the probiotic always. But for people who don't want to you know, change their diet or things, maybe a probiotic could help. And I think that's what we'll be looking at. Thank you. Um, is there any vitamins that you recommend to your patients that they take consistently? I only, so I, I, you can go back to the previous talks also, but no, no, I'll vitamin D, vitamin D is one that I specifically recommend if it's less than 30. So I would like to see a vitamin D level over 30 for most patients if possible, but or supplement. And then I'd say on plant-based diets, B12 is important to take once a week. And the reason for that is, is that B12 actually doesn't come from animal sources. It comes from actually the soil microbes. So if you eat dirt or soil, you will get B12, but we live in a very clean world. So we don't, even if we eat green, we eat them triple washed and we're not eating the soil with it. And because of that, uh, a plant-based diet is not getting enough B12, but animal-based diets get the B12 little bit better than plant-based, not completely, but the way they get it is because in animal agriculture, the, the animals are injected with B12 or they are eating the dirt and then you're eating the animals. So you get some B12 through that, but it's not like meat inherently has B12 in it. Yeah. Um, in terms of other supplements, since we're on the subject, do collagen peptide supplements pose as a danger for people with plasma cell disorders? There's no data, so I can't really say, but again, um, collagen um, it's, it's hard to know whether like the high protein or like whether collagen might be affecting the microbiome. I think these are things we need to study and understand. No, that's great to know where, where we have to work on and what we know so far. Um, I have several people wondering how they can, um, either subscribe or 
register or what is that word that I'm forgetting? Join the study <laughs> that is yeah. currently open or join the studies that are to come. So, so the studies that are currently open, like the Nutrivention pilot study, you can just reach out to me. Um, there is a, a, if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov, you will find a contact details there for the study, or you could even reach out to Audrey or something, yeah. or me, and then directly we can reach out to you with information about the study. Um, for the other studies and intervention too, we don't, we don't, it's not yet open and probably in six months it will be, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Audrey, like the myeloma crowd could create a way that y'all are starting to collect a list of names for the new prevention too, because this is going to be through Health Tree. And if we are able to collect this list, then we know when the study opens, we can send out um, an email to all the patients who are interested. So Definitely. that could be something we could um, you know, do through Health Tree, maybe a form they fill out or something, and you get their contact details. Definitely. Um, I see lots of questions here about turmeric or curcumin, and I just want you guys to know that next um, month in our nutrition and wellness for myeloma chapter, we're going to be having, um, somebody come and speak about supplements in general on how it affects, uh, cancers so specific, specifically precursor myeloma condition. This is, uh, Dr. Terry, she has, um, actually done some of the curcumin studies in myeloma in brief, there is very little data around this, and curcumin has been shown to have positive effects on the microbiome and things like that, so there may be a benefit, but it, it's not going to be a quick benefit, and it may be a long-term, and it may be in some populations, and that's part of the reason why we're studying it in the Nutrivention 2 and 3 study, because it's expensive to take these supplements, and um, we want to really understand what is it doing to the microbiome, is it helping patients, so... Um, if you're interested in doing the study, let us know. <laughs> awesome. Um, is there a difference between organic and non-organic? Go back to my talk from last year. Uh, I discussed that and bring up two, three uh, studies around it. In brief, I would say if you, it's better to eat non-organic plant foods than not eat them at all. And there may be um, if some studies have shown no difference, then maybe some studies might show a slight improvement, but that may be because people who eat organic might just be choosing a healthier lifestyle. So we don't really know. And I would say it's better to eat plants than not eat plants, even yeah. if they're organic. And I have gone over some numbers and studies in that previous talk. Yeah, and she's mentioned those previous talks. There's two talks like she talked about in the beginning um, that she had previously given last year, and we will send recordings of those sessions out in the follow-up email that will include this recording as well to your emails to everybody who registered. So if you're wondering what we're talking about, you will have access to those recordings. Um, the, there was a question about the metformin dosage in the study. That study was looking at just patients who are already on it in a large population study, so it wasn't looking at the dosage. But there is a study looking at metformin that's from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Catherine Maranak is running that one. So if you're interested in taking part in a MGA smoldering metformin study, you could, you could reach out to their team. Awesome, thank you. Um, there are some questions about if there are similar studies for relapse multiple myeloma like there are for MGUS. We would really like to do them. Um, I think, you know, this is all in, we've developed all these studies in the last few years and with the support from patients like you and the enthusiasm, I think that would be our next step. We have a study in the myeloma maintenance setting, but not in the relapse setting. And yeah. I think once we gather a little bit of data in um, this, we could start doing more studies around it. But I definitely think we'd like to do that. And my, yeah, keep asking the questions, keep attending events like this. The more um, interest that we can show in this subject is going to get us more funding, is going to get us more clinical trials, is going to get us more answers. So keep right. doing what you're doing. <laughs> I, I know it's frustrating not to have the answers you want, but this is where we start and this is how we make changes. Um, <laughs> my son's trying to get into the room. <laughs> um, so a couple other good questions, just as we finish up here. One of the attendees is wondering, the bone hair, um, their bone doctor is recommending yogurt and cheese for the calcium. 
but if they're plant-based, how can they get enough calcium? This is a common question. So I'd love for you to answer it. Um, so, you know, if you just Google like calcium rich plant foods, uh, I think kale is one of them and things you can find a lot of them. I think another important thing is just make sure your vitamin D levels are good because to get calcium from the food, you need to have good vitamin D because that's what helps absorb it. And um, if you don't have, if you have low vitamin D, as much calcium as you eat, you're not going to really absorb the, the calcium from the foods. So I think those are some of the things. And then even fortified milks like soy milk and things, a lot of them are fortified the same way as like, you know, uh, and have similar calcium content. Beans have calcium. There's a lot. So if you eat a really good whole food plant-based diet and think about a few calcium sources that you like by just Googling what are calcium plant-based sources and making sure you eat them regularly, making sure your vitamin D levels are good. I think overall you'd be fine. If you feel like you really need more, then a supplement could be okay as well, I think. Okay, awesome. Is the maintenance trial open right now, Dr. Shah? Uh, it will be, it, it will be, in the, the trial for the drugs is open and the patients will go on the nutrition part of the study at one year on the trial for the maintenance. So they, so it is open and if you go on the study when you're like close, you have to be within six months of completing your um, chemotherapy or transplant or whatever it is. And once you go on the study, the nutrition part will start at 12 months of being on the study. So we're not doing it immediately as soon as you start on the study, but within the first year. So yes, if you're interested, you could join the study now and then it will be open in 12 months and then you would be able to go, it'll, it'll be open in a few months, but you'll be able to go on it within right. a year. Okay, and I'll uh, I'll make sure that that's clear in our follow up email that they can reach out to us if they're interested in any of those studies. So, um, a couple more questions: Are vegan meats like Impossible Burgers, vegan sausage, etc., super processed or healthy? So they are very processed, but I would use them as an occasional when you're craving something or missing it, or use it as a way to transition. You know, when somebody's never eaten beans or soy or tofu and they're like, I don't like this, then maybe sometimes an occasional thing could be, you know, these are good transition things. There was a study called the swap meat study. And I think, again, I spoke about this in one of our last talks, but the swap meat study compared eating uh, basically all animal foods and then the plant-based version of those animal foods like chicken and then plant-based chicken, meat and uh, a hamburger, and, uh, impossible burger. And what they showed is it, the Beyond Meat burger. And they showed that because even though these are plant-based foods, they have some fiber because they're plant-based meats, they have some fiber in them. So there was actually a cholesterol improvement and things, not as much as if you eat beans, but there was a little bit with that compared to eating the fully animal-based food. What we don't know about it is obviously these are processed foods. So all the other chemicals or things that in the long-term may affect it. So, so I think it shouldn't be your staple diet, but if there's an occasional time somebody is really craving it or missing it, I don't think there's anything wrong with yeah. Awesome. And what has your experience been with those kind of foods, William? Well, as as uh, Dr. Shaw said, there are times when I do miss a hamburger, so I will uh, do an impossible burger. But I've I've grown accustomed to really want just plants, you know, and a black uh, bean burger or something. Yeah, so yeah. Like the black bean. yeah also, the, sorry, one thing. The issue is that they have a lot of sodium in them sometimes, mm -hmm. so you have to watch out for that if you know, hypertension or things or heart failure is an issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. And then um, somebody asked about fiber um, and yeah. should we take a fiber supplement to get to 30 grams? Um, I think, like I said, again, those are shortcuts, probiotics, fiber, everything by, by taking a supplement, but a fiber supplement is again, not the variety that your microbiome needs. It's again, going to be one type of fiber. So I don't think it's the same thing, but um, you know, it's better probably than not doing anything. Okay. Awesome. And same with iron supplement. What's your opinion on that? I would only take it if you're iron deficient, otherwise you don't need it. And a lot of people who are anemic and not iron deficient end up taking iron supplements and they shouldn't be because iron overload is also a problem and too much iron is not good. So only take it if you're iron deficient, otherwise there's no need for it. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Are egg whites and whole eggs, do they have the same health profile? Um, whole eggs have a lot of cholesterol. They have choline and it's the, the, the yellow part of it has, the white has um, 
a little more protein. So there is a difference significant in terms of the nutrition value of a whole egg compared to a, uh, uh, this thing. But col cholesterol from eggs is quite a bit or there there is going to be if you are eating the yellow of it. So I would say that, yeah, occasional eggs are fine, but I wouldn't make that a daily staple. There is no study has shown that eggs reduce cancer or reduce but they've shown maybe slight increase in sub studies maybe no difference but if you're actually looking at foods that reduce risk then the eggs don't fall into that what were you going to say william well yeah. i i was going to ask that to show you know i i really missed eggs and then i discovered something called just egg which is yes. um, uh, mung beans i believe yes and uh it comes in two forms it's frozen and it's a yeah. patty and and it's easy to cook and then it's uh comes in a liquid the key is cook it low and slow, but it is so close to eggs that I, it's become my my go to breakfast. I, I, I make it sometimes too, and um, I, I rarely want to, you know, uh, have the scrambled egg or something. But I, I don't miss it that much, so I don't. But uh, my husband does, so I make it more because of him. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's finish with this question. Um, Actually, okay, sorry, two more questions. Barbara's wondering with celiac disease, how she can get enough fiber. Um, so, you know, we think about um, celiac disease means you can't eat gluten, but there are so many different whole grains um, that are non-gluten whole grains, like there are millets and there is quinoa and there's buckwheat and all of these things. So focusing on, and I, I would say this to even people who are non-celiac, what happens in the world just now is that you go out to eat a pizza, you go to eat pasta, you eat a, like any bread, everything is wheat and you, you, you just don't end up eating other grains. So you, you have to make it your mission to eat other grains, otherwise you'll never eat them. And I, I also was a part of the same problem where like I would just, you know, automatically, like we're so used to the taste of wheat, like for everything, like breads and all that, that's what we pick. But now like I actually actively seek out different grains and I'll say like this week and I won't, and rice is the other one. We constantly eat rice with everything, white rice and wheat. Those are the two things everybody <laughs> eats. But, um, I actually will make millets sometimes or quinoa sometimes or buckwheat or different things to eat with um, the lentils that I make or something so that I'm not eating rice every single day or eating wheat. So it's good to switch it up, like I said already. And I think if you're celiac, then you just don't have the wheat, but there's so many other whole grains if you look them up. Awesome. Thank you. And then for the last question, and just so you two know, there are comment sections full of thank yous and great jobs, and especially you, William, how inspiring your story is. So thank you again for taking the time to share with us tonight. Um, let's finish with Anita's question, because I think this is a common misconception. How can you lose weight and get enough protein without gaining weight? So... Uh, this is, I think I'd shown a slide around protein and fiber in my last talk. That's why I didn't repeat it here. But actually, a whole food plant-based diet, if you, you actually count the amount of protein in a day, and I had made an example of like plant-based food, every food has carbohydrates, fat, and protein, because these are the three building blocks. So you can't take away, there's no food with zero protein. It would be very unusual. Most foods have some. So if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, even broccoli has protein and things like that. So you will get enough. And I think we live in a world that's protein obsessed, but I think we should be living in a world that's fiber obsessed. And I think if you get enough fiber from your food, you because you're eating whole foods, you will get your protein. We don't really need that much protein. So people on animal-based diets who like a Western diet probably get two times the amount of protein that's required. Um, on average, like we need about 0.8 grams per kilo and they easily get two grams per kilo on an animal-based diet. On a plant-based diet that's whole food, you will get over one and a half grams or more than one gram per kilo. So you're already exceeding it with a plant-based diet and with an animal-based diet, you're over exceeding it. And there are some studies showing kidney diseases associated with more animal-based foods and protein foods. So there is association where just more protein is not always healthy. Thank you for that. And I think William's just a testament to the fact that he was able to lose weight and feel better about himself. I mean, 
you you already said it all well well, well i noticed there's there's a question from ellen about night eating i used to do a lot of night eating but i'm I, being plant-based i'm not hungry at night anymore so that um that's that's not part of what i do um so i have uh, three meals and they're all plant-based and very nutritious very filling and i'm i'm just enjoying it if i get an urge to eat something at night i'll i'll take uh, about 12 shelled pecans or uh, a few uh, almonds and that's that's it awesome awesome that's, that's so inspiring <laughs> i'm like i need to eat healthy <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much for your participation. I'm just going to end with a couple outro announcements, but thank you so much. And um, I hope to see you both again very soon. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks. So in our, you can join us for our next meeting. We're going to be meeting every other month as part of the MDES Smoldering chapter. And we're going to be talking next time about MRD testing or minimal residual disease testing within precursor conditions. So MGUS smoldering. Is it recommended to test for minimal residual disease as a precursor patient? Why or why not? And more details about this event will be coming shortly. You may be interested in other myeloma crowd community events we have coming up on the 26th. We're going to be talking about how to navigate neuropathy through nutrition. On the 27th, we're going to be um, hosting our African-American myeloma community chapter. We're gonna be talking about fitness tips for your winter exercise reboot with fitness expert, Vanya. And then the first is gonna be our budgeting workshop. And we're gonna be talking about how to pay for the costs of cancer through budgeting, getting our financial affairs in order. The link to sign up for any of those events, <clears throat> excuse me, and even more events that I haven't mentioned is found at the bottom of the slide and will be sent out in the follow-up email, along with the different recordings and resources that we've mentioned today. Um, and <clears throat> feel free to reach out to me. I see some people asking about Dr. Shaw's contact info, Will's contact info. I'll be the middleman for them. Um, when we send out our email, respond to me saying, hey, I wanna be in contact with them and, and I can make that connection for you. Once again, a thank you to our sponsors, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Takeda Oncology, Care your Farm Therapeutics, Adaptive Bi Biotechnologies, Janssen Oncology, AbV, Santa Fe, Amgen Oncology, and Genentech. Thank you to each of you for spending the night, some of your night with us or day, depending on where you're located. And we're just really appreciative of the information that was shared here. We appreciate you. Hope that you have a great rest of your night. And um, thank you all so much. Take care. <laughs>